Wes Anderson. You may know him as that guy who uses symmetry in just about every shot throughout his films. I find that either you love him or you hate him. Much of his criticism derives from the opinion that his films are too quirky and too fake. However, I believe that his films are more like a painting of moving images unfolding right in front of our eyes. I would like to propose that there is much more going on in Anderson's work beyond just an OCD-like obsession for a centered frame. In this video essay, I will argue that Wes Anderson's latest film, The Grand Budapest Hotel, manipulates the objects within the frame and even the frame itself through the use of visual cues that we discussed in class, including color, form, and depth. To develop the relationship between Monsieur Gustave H., the hotel concierge, Zero Mustafa, the immigrant lobby boy, and Agatha, the village baker. To make sense of all of this on a cinematic level, we need to understand a fancy word called mise-en-scene, which is basically just everything in front of the camera. Elements like set design, lighting, space, composition, costume, makeup, acting, film stock, and aspect ratio are all parts of mise-en-scene. For this visual analysis, we are only going to focus on four of these. The Grand Budapest Hotel is unique in that it is one of the only movies that changes the shape of the frame, or aspect ratio, to establish the four main time periods in which the story takes place. We begin with a standard 16x9 frame to establish present day and 1985, a visual cue for the rise of the modern widescreen standard that we see today. The film then switches to an anamorphic 2.35 to 1 widescreen aspect ratio in 1968. This is a visual cue for Cinemascope, a film presentation format which was popularized during the 60s. The majority of the film takes place in a more modest 4.3 aspect ratio to set us way back in 1932. Anderson likely chose this frame to make the viewer feel as though we were back in the classical cinema era of the 30s. Through these different aspect ratios, the stage is now set for us to jump between timelines and they allow the older Zero to act as a narrator as he develops those stories between him, Monsieur Gustave, and Agatha. Throughout the film, there are some really great uses of light and color to show the relationship between the three central characters. The movie begins with a much older Zero Mustafa recounting his tale. Well, it begins, as it must, with our mutual friend's predecessor the beloved original concierge of the Grand Budapest. It begins, of course, with... The camera moves in and the lighting becomes much more dramatic. Warm lights turn on behind his head and we cut back to the story of Monsieur Gustave. These lighting and color cues signify Zero's fondness for Monsieur Gustave and how he enjoys retelling the experiences they shared together. We see these lighting cues happen once again at the dinner table between the writer and the older Zero later in the film. However, this time, they are discussing the love of his life, Agatha. He was crying. You see, I never speak of Agatha because, even at the thought of her name, I'm unable to control my emotions. Although Agatha is an Irish immigrant, she is seen with a birthmark on her face in the shape of Mexico, a visual signifier, especially to American audiences, that the immigrant couple was meant to be. While recounting his story, Agatha is seen in a close-up with soft focus. Warm circular lights revolve around her head to signify that she is the center of Zero's world, whole and pure. Both of these warm, colorful, and soft-lit scenes are later contrasted near the end of the film when Monsieur Gustave, Zero, and Agatha are riding the train. Well, hello there, chaps. We were just talking about you. Documents, please. With pleasure. They are stopped by the army, and Monsieur Gustave is taken outside and killed. This is the only black and white scene in the film. The color is literally drained from the narrative to represent one of the darkest days in Zero's life. The day that his mentor and best friend is shot dead. The final point I want to talk about is Anderson's composition and staging. In other words, how much space a person takes in the frame and where they are positioned in relation to others. Let's take a look at how the relationship between Monsieur Gustave and Zero develops through the movie based on composition alone. Near the beginning of the film, Zero is often framed in the background or edge of the frame, while Monsieur Gustave is the central and larger object in the frame. This shows Zero's submissiveness to his boss, as Monsieur Gustave is the dominating subject of the frame. This compositional balance of powers can also be seen with Dimitri and Jopling, the antagonists of the film. Once Monsieur Gustave is framed for murder, She's been murdered. And you think I did it. Hey! Zero and Agatha help Monsieur Gustave escape prison, 
For this act, he is eternally grateful, and now sees the two as equal to himself. You are my dear friend and protege, and I'm very proud of you. You must know that. This shift is shown visually in the composition, as Monsieur Gustave and Zero now dominate the same part of the frame and share equal importance in each other's lives. So next time you watch a Wes Anderson film, look beyond his symmetrical style and think about how elements of color, form, and depth are being used within each frame to explore the relationships between the characters in the story.